Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next of the Foreman Case Study Series. This afternoon, we've got Chris here from the Health Advisory Board. Um, welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, Greg. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. It's really appreciated. We really like hearing all the interesting ways people are using Foreman out there in the community. Um, I was wondering if you want to just start off with a, a little bit of background for us about uh, who you are, who the company is, you know, how Foreman is useful to you, that kind of stuff. Sure. So um, I'm a senior sysadmin here at the advisory board company. Uh, we're a healthcare technology company. Um, so basically, uh, a lot of our members are hospitals. Um, and a lot of our products um, are used by hospitals in many different ways, uh, primarily in the technology side of things, but also some consulting and research as well. Um, I started as like your pretty typical sysadmin here, and then as our environment grew and developed, uh, kind of led into like the automation role pretty much uh, with the use of Puppet and um, automating configurations on our systems. And then from there, uh, we really didn't like the open source dashboard uh, that Puppet provided. So we found Foreman, and it's really kind of just blown up ever since that. Cool, cool. That's very interesting. So um, is it, was it just the dashboard that really got you in there? Have you grown to do things like provisioning since then? Yeah, so the reason we originally started using Foreman is we, we basically just needed a front end of you know, what our Puppet environment looks like, what nodes are failing, which ones have changes, what got changed, um, and ENC to apply different classes. Um, and then from there, uh, it moved into utilizing uh, the reporting. Uh, we provision now through Foreman to both EC2 and VMware. Uh, we utilize the roles, or I'm sorry, we utilize the locations and organizations for better role-based access. Um, we have three to four different plugins we use as well, uh, and a DHCP, uh, Puppet, C and CA uh, smart proxy. Uh, currently, uh, we're working on DNS uh, for the near future. Always the fun one. Yeah. <laughs> So that's that's really cool. So I mean, obviously, you mentioned the focus of this case study is on the HA stuff, right? So obviously, that's that's really really important to you guys, and I know you've done uh, a lot of work around that. Do you want to start diving into that, or is there is there things we need to talk about first? Uh, no, we could definitely dive into the HA side of things. Um, pretty much, as uh, Foreman became like more crucial for our infrastructure, uh, we needed to ensure that it was available. Uh, as much as it could be. We had clustered puppet masters at the time, so things during patch windows and maintenance and stuff, puppet was staying up. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, we had a single foreman instance, so when that server got patched and the CA was running on that server as well, uh, everything kind of went down anyway. Um, so we really started doing a lot of research and figuring out, you know, how could we make this implementation as available as possible at all times and basically make it you know fairly resilient for what we need it to be. Um, so we started by moving, you know, we moved the CA off of the Foreman box, of course, and put that off on its own, and we clustered that too. Um, and then we started doing a bunch of research into, you know, how to actually you know cluster a Foreman instance and uh, what considerations do we need to take. Um, and basically, you know, what we needed to learn a lot is, you know, how does Foreman actually work, right? Because when we were running one instance, it was just cool. It's a web app. Everything's right here. Everything's going to this host. Um, all of a sudden, when we needed to, you know, have multiple uh, Foreman nodes running and be kept in sync, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot about, you know, how the sessions are stored in the database, uh, how do we keep the different web UIs, um, all up to date, and so there's no lag there. Uh, what ports and where does everything communicate over? Um, so it was really, really interesting going through the process uh, because even though I've used Foreman for a while and had a pretty good working understanding of it, um, going through this implementation really allowed me to learn more of the inner workings of it and um, understand better how everything actually works and talks to each other um, and basically how the traffic flows. Um, cool. Sorry, Tom. So, uh, I was just going to say, so what we decided to do 
um, is build a three node cluster uh, and put that behind a load balancer, uh, which you know was super easy to build. The Foreman installer was great for that. It made really quick work of getting everything set up with the exception of a few things. Um, I guess we could come back to that uh, in a little while. Um, but after that, uh, it was figuring out, you know, the sessions are stored in the database, so, you know, you don't have to do any persistence or anything on the load balancer, which is awesome, because uh, we could do some really cool things later on. Um, but I learned a good amount about Memcache and the Memcache plugin for Foreman. Uh, that was pretty much a requirement. Um, so that no matter what instance you hit, you were always getting um, the same data and the most up-to-date data. Uh, because one thing I didn't know is if you don't use the memcache plugin, Foreman doesn't call the database for everything. It calls a local cache for some things, um, which I didn't know before. And it actually helped me in troubleshooting some stuff a couple weeks ago when we were seeing some issues. Um, so like I said, it went back to you know learning more about how Foreman works. And then you know once we got that up, it was honestly pretty smooth sailing uh, with a couple things uh, that I didn't know about. One, the encryption key.rb file has to be the same across all nodes, which uh, you realize pretty quickly when you can't log in and you're seeing that things don't get uh, decrypted. Yeah, absolutely. I've just uh, just been asked if uh, if you've got any diagrams to show as well. We're talking about the the setup that you've come up with. Oh yeah, yeah sure. Uh, let me share my screen and I'll pull that up. Uh, I apologize in advance. I am not the greatest at coming up with diagrams. Um, are you seeing the, the Gliffy screen right now? I am indeed. Okay. Uh, so I apologize for the loops of the arrows and everything. Um, but all of this is on internal networks. Um, so pretty much everything sits behind the same load balancer, with the exception of the memcache servers. Uh, those are outside the load balancer completely, and uh, pretty much the memcache plugin for Foreman handles all of that. But um, we have uh, two CA servers, Puppet CA servers, uh, clustered behind the load balancer, uh, active, passive. Uh, we run uh, four Puppet server, uh, version one cluster, two Puppet DB servers, uh, like I said, uh, three Foreman nodes, and then we run uh, two PostgreSQL servers. Uh, they, those don't sit behind the load balancer because they're using pgpool. Um, I can't go into too much how pgpool works and that all works because I didn't set that part up. Um, but everything else um, I could talk about in pretty good detail. Um, so really what we found out and in doing uh, some research and quite a bit of Googling and asking around an IRC. Uh, we had two, two choices in how we wanted to build out our HA implementation. Uh, to be honest, we went with the simpler way uh, right now because it fit our current needs. Uh, if we need to, we can always uh, implement uh, the other part of it, uh, which is basically you have two Foreman clusters, uh, one cluster just for your web UI, and then another cluster that is your reporting and your ENC functions. Um, and basically the only difference there is that on your Puppet servers in the foreman.yaml file, you put in the URL to your ENC and reporting cluster. And basically all the catalog reports get sent there, all the ENC rendering goes through there. And then your other cluster, which is basically just the web UI, um, is what your users hit. Uh, to view everything and do all the other stuff. Um, so we didn't go that route. We kept it simple. Uh, three nodes that do everything. Um, but like I said, it's pretty simple if we want it to expand it out, which I have a feeling we're going to in the future as we continue to grow. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want me to kind of talk through the flow of traffic here, uh, but I don't know. I'm pretty sure everyone's pretty familiar with um, like how the nodes, the Puppet nodes request things and how information gets to Foreman from the smart proxies and stuff. Sure, sure. I guess um, I guess the first question that jumps to mind for myself is um, what are you doing with the SSL, right? Are you terminating at the load balancer or are you taking it right through to Foreman? Um, so currently we're taking, uh, we're doing full SSL pass through on the load balancer to Foreman. 
Um, and that's mainly because when we were setting all of this up, uh, we kind of just followed suit with what we were doing for the uh, puppet side of things. Um, what we're probably going to end up doing is terminating on the load balancer uh, because what we found uh, recently uh, when we were troubleshooting a couple issues, uh, it became really, really hard to get some good details uh, because we weren't able to see any of the encrypted traffic that was flowing through the load balancer. Uh, so probably in the, in the near future, uh, we're going to terminate on the load balancer just for the form inside of things. Um, that way we get some better insight into the traffic that's flowing through. Cool. Okay. That's, that's, that's good to know because obviously, um, people have very different opinions of, of how to handle SSL when it comes to, to HA. I noticed looking at your diagram, have you, you haven't, am I think? Am I seeing just a single set of smart proxies, or have you got HA at the proxy level as well? Uh, OK, so yes, we have. So outside the load balancer uh, is where DHCP DNS smart proxies will lie, because those are on single host. Um, each of the Puppet CA servers and each of the Puppet servers themselves have an individual smart proxy on them. Um, and they all share um, a commonly named certificate. So when a smart proxy request, let's say, to import puppet classes into Foreman goes out, right? it hits a virtual IP on the load balancer, and basically just round robin to whichever one of the uh, smart proxies on the puppet servers is next in line. Right, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, how are you, are you just using standard sort of class deployment stuff like R10K or something like that to keep all the, the puppet? Uh, uh, classes in order, so it doesn't matter which one you hit, right? So we're actually not using R10K uh, at all. We're using a mix of Bamboo and Git, um, and we have a shared NFS uh, storage on the back end uh, for all of our uh, puppet classes in each of the environments. Um, so basically, when uh, code gets pushed out through Bamboo, um, it's going to make uh, an SSH connection with a service account and SSH keys uh, to the common URL uh, of our Puppet server cluster. And it's going to issue uh, git pulls or git clones, whichever is needed, uh, to push out the new code. And then that's getting uh, put directly onto an NFS mount uh, that's shared amongst the four Puppet servers. Right, right. So when okay. we deploy code, it doesn't matter which one it hits, because it's all going to shared storage. Sure, shared storage is certainly one solution. Um, so uh, just to put this in perspective, if I don't know whether you can answer this, uh, but we had a question in uh, about uh, what, what sort of size of infrastructure we're talking about here. How many, how many hosts are you dealing with? Sure, sure. So um, right now, we're kind of in a migration pattern right now. Uh, this was uh, recently built within the last you know month or so. Um, so we're still working on migrating hosts from our uh, standalone form and instance to this new uh, HA implementation. Uh, but right now we're at about 1,700 hosts, probably close to 1,800 total for our uh, in environment. Um, and that's including uh, this infrastructure here that we're looking at. Um, but probably I would say, uh, if I were to estimate by next year this time, uh, we'd probably be looking at uh, 2,500 to 3,000 hosts. Was that um, 1,800 that have been migrated or 1,800 total? Uh, 1,800 total. Right, OK, cool. So so I can see why you're thinking about whether you're going to need to set, separate out your ENC and your reporting, right? So Because when you're getting up to sort of multiple thousands of hosts, it starts to get interesting. Right, exactly. So I mean, we're getting slightly off HA for a moment, but I think migration is also an interesting topic for some people. Are you having any uh, interesting fun migrating from from your old form into your new setup? Are you are you automating that somewhere? Is it literally just a, a cut and paste one at a time type of operation? Um, so the biggest thing right now um, for our migration that we're planning out and really uh, looking at very closely um, is we're trying to identify good candidates. Uh, to be migrated uh, because we revamped our entire co code base for Puppet for this design. Um, we went to a complete roles, profiles, Hiera, uh, you know, code base, which we weren't doing before. Uh, we were very heavily 
relying on um, using Foreman and the smart class parameters. Um, so we're identifying you know, good candidates to migrate over. Um, but what it's looking like after we audit the configurations on the existing servers and uh, make sure the higher data for the the new uh, structure is where it needs to be. Um, the CA we built for this implementation is actually the same CA uh, for the other one. Um, so pretty much uh, we're just going to change uh, the Puppet Master it looks at and the CA server it looks at and then uh, pretty much let Puppet run and make whatever changes it needs to um, and then everything should show up in this new instance uh, and then from there we could track any changes that we, we have to and uh, kind of troubleshoot any unforeseen things that come up. Um, but it's definitely going to be handled very, very delicately. Right, these things always are. Sorry, did you say that was a shared CA, or are you using AutoSign or something when you move them to the new servers? Uh, so we do use AutoSign um, for all of our hosts. Uh, but the the CA, the CA cluster that we built here is uh, the same CA servers that were same CA that we're currently using. Um, so we just pretty much uh, migrated all the certs and the CA certificate over to this uh, CA cluster. Um, and we left the other one running for kind of our uh, legacy hosts, if you will. Um, so hosts that have been deployed in our previous implementation uh, won't need to have new certs generated and assigned uh, for this implementation. Uh, we could use the same certs, like none of them are set to expire anytime soon. Um, and it makes the migration path pretty painless uh, for that side of things. Yeah, you say that no, only time soon, but in my experience, certificates creep up on you faster than you think. They do, uh, is why I love the uh, Puppet CA prox smart proxy for Foreman, because I could go in there and I could see uh, when, um, when all their certificates are scheduled to expire, which is awesome. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that is helpful. Um, so I think I'm not... I'm not seeing any more questions just now about the the form inside HA setup. Um, that that seems uh, fairly good. Although, if anyone watching has uh, wants to clarify anything, do do get in touch. Um, I have had a question about whether you guys are using Catella with this, or whether you're, you're a pure Foreman setup here. Um, so right now we are a pure Foreman setup. Um, I really really like the development and the work that is going on in the Catella project, um, and I follow it fairly closely. Um, but we haven't moved over to a full Catello implementation um, only because, and this might have changed since the last time I looked, I'm not 100% sure, uh, but the last time I did check, and it's something I do try and keep a close eye on, uh, is that we would need to rebuild uh, Foreman completely. There's not kind of a Catello implementation where you could use an existing Foreman deploy. Right, I believe that's still the case, although I've no doubt one of my colleagues will correct me very quickly if I've said something wrong. I do think um, there's an issue out there working on that. Um, I've heard it mentioned before, but yeah, like the last time I checked, that's really the only thing stopping us right now. Right, and you're not the only one in that position, I think. So uh, I, th I believe it's an active topic, but uh, sadly not a trivial one. So um, I'm just going to look through some of my notes here. So I guess if... If, uh, if we're waiting for, for potentially more questions on on the layout, you you mentioned that you you came across some interesting issues uh, with various parts of the setup along the way. Do you have any uh, any advice, any gotchas for anybody setting up uh, something similar? Um, so pretty much, uh, what I would say is when you're building out um, an a NHA implementation of Foreman, um, obviously you know you do want to use the Foreman installer. Uh, it's super helpful. It makes things very easy, uh, but you, you do want to go through and you know make sure everything is you know what you need it to be. That way, you're not changing things manually uh, after the fact. And then you know when you update, risking having configurations wiped out that are necessary. Um, you obviously want to use um, generated certs that are a shared name. You don't want to use the certs that are generated as the individual host name. Um, that will cause you issues. Um, one of the big things, like I mentioned earlier, is the encryption key.rb file needs to be the same across the uh, the cluster, or else um, really only the the first node that you stand up 
uh, we'll be able to decrypt, decrypt uh, information from the database. Um, I don't think there's something in the form and installer where you could put in like your own encryption key string and uh, have that created across everything. But um, you know that would be cool if that got in there. Uh, another thing is you know definitely uh, even if it's you know just saving time is move your uh, answers.yaml file from host to host. That way you're not uh, doing the form installer configuration, you know, n number of times and, you know, risking missing something or a typo or anything like that. Um, and then the memcache plugin. Uh, that's something that isn't in the form and installer right now. Uh, but, you know, memcache is crucial uh, to having the cluster uh, function efficiently. Um, so definitely uh, remember to get that installed on all the nodes, build out your memcache servers. Um, I chose not to have them run on the form and host, and I chose to run two of them. You obviously don't need to. Um, but that was another thing, too, because like, I know the form and installer is supporting more and more plugins, uh, like the Puppet DB plugin and the Hooks plugin and a couple other ones. Um, I think as far as like HA goes, um, if the memcache plugin got integrated into the installer, um, it would be a tremendous help and kind of just streamline the process. Cool, that's, that's useful stuff. Let me just write those down and we can get some bugs submitted for those because I think that's, those are valid use cases, right? So um, that's cool. Um, I guess we've got a couple of directions we could go in here. You mentioned you, you well, actually, look, while we're talking about the installer, um, since you mentioned it for the encryption thing, uh, you said you came across of some things while you were doing your, your sort of three node proof of concept. Um, is, there, is there anything you want to add to that part of the discussion? As far as like the installer goes? Or? Yeah, right back at the beginning, you said you came across a, a bunch of stuff that, that we could come back to. So uh, I don't know whether that was the thing that you came across. Or <laughs> uh, so yeah, th uh, that, was, that was mostly uh, everything I came across. Um, one of the things that I, uh, that's not really related to the actual deploy functioning um, that I came across too was I found myself going back and configuring the logging uh, by hand after the fact, um, just because I know there's more in-depth logging now with Foreman. You have like the SQL logging, the application logging. I think there's LDAP logging, um, and I wasn't overly familiar with uh, setting that up through the installer. Um, so that was something I did after the fact. I looked at it a little bit, um, but didn't want to. Didn't want to, uh, you know. Uh, risk having bad configurations in there, um, but other, other than that, the form installer uh, was you know very very smooth. I you know don't really ever have any issues with it um, until some things that I I noticed were just not there for doing an HA deployment. Cool, that's really good, and it's really good to hear um, that the the answers YAML um, is useful because really the the rationale was behind that. That was definitely one of the use cases. The the other one being that people can send it with a bug report so that, that yeah, someone no, trying to verify it can actually send it. Yaml has been great. Like I've used it for this. I've used it in the past to kind of um, troubleshoot. You know why why am I not getting the configuration I'm thinking of when I. Uh, when I do this deploy, like one of the things was when I was trying to use the form and installer to set up Puppet Server rather than Puppet Master. Um, and the uh, Puppet Server was installed, but the service trying to be started was HTTPD. So I went back in the answers.yaml, and uh, basically what I found was I changed the, the, the install value for the puppet install, but I didn't change the uh, service that it looks for to start and restart. Um, so the answers that YAML is really helpful when troubleshooting um, installation issues. Cool. You mentioned puppet server actually. Are you I, I, that came with late three X series? Are you still you're still on three X presumably? Uh, yes, I b believe we're on three eight. Three. Um, we're planning to update to three eight four. Uh, I think we have an issue in to do it this week. Um, basically, we're trying to cover all of our bases and follow the uh, the preparation steps uh, in order to migrate up to Puppet four. 
um, once it's fully supported in form. And of course, since that's a core piece of what we do. Um, but yeah, we run Puppet Server version one. one. Uh, we try and stay on the latest version of 3.8 for Puppet. Uh, we have Puppet DB on the latest 2.x version. Um, I believe the 3.x version you need Puppet 4 for, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, so we try and keep everything pretty up to date. Um, okay, so I've got a question in, uh, from from uh, one of our community from Duncan uh, asking if uh, if you if most of this sort of setup was uh, was scripted or, or were they all built manually? Uh, we were you building the hosts? You know, did you build your secondary form and host from the first one since you're doing provisioning or? How, how did you sort of go about the initial kind of bootstrapping? Sure. So um, the initial host builds were from a VMware template. Um, so they got built. And then um, one of each node, so one CA server, one Puppet server, one Puppet DB server, one Foreman server, um, was built uh, by hand. Uh, mostly configured with the form and installer minus the puppet db host and then from there uh the additional hosts were provisioned through foreman and configured uh by puppet um or the form and installer in the case of the puppet servers the puppet server install and the uh foreman install Cool, cool. That's interesting. I think uh, I think where where Duncan was going was whether or not there's anything sort of publishable um, from that. Um, but I guess it sounds like you've either you've got a combination of sort of manual template stuff and yeah. form installer I stuff. Is so. anything really publishable? Um, the form and installer was used to set up uh, like form in itself and the puppet server implementation. Um, the puppet DB module. Uh, was used to build the Puppet DB hosts, um, and the memcache module was built to, or was used to build the memcache hosts. Um, but after those first rounds of uh, hosts were set up, all their provisioning was done uh, through Foreman itself. Cool. Um, speaking of publishing, though, I mean, do you have any plans to to document uh, how you built all of this? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, I definitely want to contribute back since everyone in the community has, well, quite honestly, everyone in the community is the reason I was able to build all of this. Um, so I'm definitely uh, contributing back. I'm going to work on a guest blog post and submit a PR to the Foreman blog. Fantastic. And that was not the leading question of the year. <laughs> um, so I guess... Um, Oh, I'll keep an eye out for more HA specific questions, but let's just uh, talk a little bit more generally about Foreman. Um, obviously, you've been using it for a while. You've been in the community for a while. I, I know you reasonably well from IRC. Um, how how do you find it? What do you what do you love? What particular things about Foreman itself do you, do you love? Do you hate? Do you not use? You do use. What what what, what are your comments on Foreman itself? Um, so I honestly like. I have very, very few complaints about Foreman. Um, I, I've found that it always either fits my needs and our needs uh, either fully, or if there's something that is missing, um, it's already being worked on. So like, for example, um, like I was in IRC last week talking about asking if Foreman supports uh, resource pools for VMware, because that's a need we have. And you know it doesn't do it right now, um, but I was got talking to a couple people in IRC and searching through the red mine, and it's slated to be released in 1.11. So, like, it always seems that there's, that, like, the forming community and the developers and everything actually do, you know, really listen to um, feature requests and what people are asking for. Like, I've never had an issue or a situation where it was, no, it doesn't support that, and, you know, it's not even on the roadmap. Um, so that's really great. Um, it really is like a, an easy uh, tool to use, I feel. Um, we have it set up. This is our test lab instance. Um, we have it set up like fairly uh, simplistic here uh, with our uh, host group structure and um, our locations and organizations. 
Um, it's easy to get around, find the information on the hosts. Um, yeah, like I, I really just think it's a very, very simple front end uh, to a back end that has the ability to be extremely complex. And I think when we were first looking at it, it offered a ton of features that Puppet Dashboard didn't, which is the reason why we went with Foreman. Um, I know Puppet Dashboard recently has been catching up with things like Razor and a few other things. Um, but I mean, uh, just the community around Foreman and everything we've used it for, um, I, I think it's it might be you know the best or one of the better tools out there. Um, using the Fog backend makes it super easy uh, to provision to any number of uh, hypervisors like VMware EC2, um, OpenStack, Rackspace. Like we have a small uh, EC2 footprint as well. Um, so Foreman's like our one-stop place for all provisioning, whether it be VMware or EC2, or really if we have anything else we go to. Um, so we really rely on it very heavily um, to kind of be like our single source of truth for a lot of things. Cool. I, I noticed you use uh, locations and organizations there as well. How how do you? That's a controversial feature. Uh, yeah, a lot of. Uh, I was how do you find it? Uh, recently, because I watched uh, the, one of the other case studies uh, where locations and organizations came up as kind of a you know a controversial feature. Uh, I think the Foreman survey from this past year showed that almost like nobody uses them, um, and I don't think uh, the general consensus is a lot of the developers like it because it clutters the code. Um, but please, please do not ever remove them uh, from the code base. Like they are so crucial to um, how like the ability to have role-based access controls and manage your infrastructure. Um, so, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I, I was just going to say, <clears throat> you've raised a really interesting point, because the debate that's, that's been going on is if people are only using them as a role-based access um, system, and we have, the, if we were to make the capability to do something similar within the existing authorization system, is there any other use case that, that locations and organizations provide which couldn't be done? Because we basically have two levels of authorization, right, at the moment, is, is the view of some people. Um, so the question is, do we, do we keep them both? Do they both provide unique points, or could we make them one thing? And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but that's one debate that's going on. Right. So the, the way it ties into role-based access for us is we have a number of different product teams and a number of different uh, locations. Uh, so for example, we have three physical two physical data centers, our AWS uh, environment, and um, like I said, a number of product teams. Um, so what locations and organizations helps us do is when we create uh, user groups and roles, right, for different people, we can say, you know, that uh, this product team uh, can only view this organization, which is, you know, their product, and only view these locations, which is where their product lives. Sometimes it's only one location. There are times where their product lives in multiple locations. Um, but we use it a lot for that. Um, what's also great is by being able to have those parameters classified uh, be classified for individual hosts or even host groups or wherever you want to do it as long as it gets filtered down to the individual hosts um, we're able to run um, reports very easily on you know where most of our hosts lie in what location um, where most of the different product hosts lie in which location how many hosts our different product teams currently have um, we also use uh, location and organization uh, as tiers in our uh, higher hierarchy um, for different configurations. Um, so there definitely is a need, or a use case, I should say, for them beyond uh, just authentication purposes. Um, and it's something we've worked in pretty heavily. Um, I don't know if it's you know necessarily a use case for the vast majority of people, or if there's you know better ways of implementing things like that. Um, but for what we were trying to do, uh, it seemed like it was 
you know, a very straightforward, easy way to um, get additional information uh, that we required. Cool. That was really useful information. I think uh, I think you make a good point about um, things like higher levels and things like that. Um, so it's it's good to know how people are using a feature. Um, so what else came up for me? Ah, you mentioned um, you were talking about how you compare to, to dashboard, and, and you mentioned Razor, and that led me to think about discovery, and and that leads to the wider question of um, do you use any plugins in particular, apart from obviously the Memcache plugin? Is there things there you rely on? Yeah, so we use a fair amount of plugins um, or have some plugins installed for future use. Um, so we obviously use the Memcache plugin. Um, the form and column view plugin was actually uh, the first plugin we implemented, and it has been fantastic. So actually, thank you, Greg. I don't think I ever got to thank you for that. Um, it's been great since we can add additional columns on the all host page. So we primarily use it there uh, to include a column that shows the IP address and the comments field. Um, the comments field is very big for us for knowing what you know those hosts do and what they link to and some important information about them. Um, for hosts that aren't having their ma lifecycle managed by Foreman, um, we use it to uh, add some additional columns on the host properties page, like uh, memory and CPUs and things like that. Um, hosts that are managed have the lifecycle managed. We could obviously see that stuff on the VM tab, um, but we want to be able to see that across the board for like some of our legacy stuff. Uh, we use the custom banner plugin um, mainly just because our test lab instance, which is what we're looking at now in our production instance, um, look extremely similar. So we want it something across the top of the page just you know to make people aware of where they are just in case uh, so we use that for the reasons the form and DHCP browser uh, is not heavily used but uh, it's nice to have the ability to kind of go into your subnets and kind of see you know what MAC addresses host IP addresses are on each subnet from right in Foreman uh, you only get the ones that Foreman manages but you know, in time, uh, it grows to be pretty extensive and pretty useful. Uh, form and hooks is one we have in that we haven't actually utilized yet. That's for some uh, future plans we want to try and implement uh, as part of the provisioning process. Uh, because we can, as far as I understand, I honestly haven't done a lot of research into it. Um, you could have scripts execute an action uh, based on actions taken in Foreman. Um, like destroys and things like that. Uh, so we're going to be looking into that and hopefully implementing some things there. Uh, form and templates is is huge for us. All of our provisioning templates are kept in version control. Uh, so whenever we update those, uh, it goes through a bamboo build and then a, a rake task is run against Foreman to update them uh, on the host, on the nodes, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so our provisioning template deployment and updates uh, are, are really smooth uh, thanks to the templates plugin. Um, that's actually another thing I forgot to mention before. Uh, everything is kept in the database, so you don't have to worry about running like rate commands uh, for things like templates and stuff to get deployed on each node. You just run it on one node and it's there everywhere. So that's super awesome too. And then uh, the Puppet DB form and plugin, uh, which is really easy to set up since it's right in the installer. We use uh, we don't use Puppet DB extensively yet, uh, but we do have some plans uh, to look into implementing some of the features it gives us and some of the reporting. The reporting I use it to look at. I don't know why it does that sometimes. I gotta look into that. Um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, we mainly just uh, use it to keep track of uh, nodes in our population, our resource duplication percentage, catalog duplication percentage, um, and resources we have managed. Um, just to get some more insight into our environment, kind of, you know, what it looks like, how many things are we actually managing, uh, what's, how many things, you know, are changing between every 
uh, Puppet Run across the infrastructure. Um, so really, that's what the only thing we're using it for right now. And you know, since Foreman's kind of where we go to for everything, having the ability to have the Puppet DB dashboard right here uh, just makes things that much easy easier. Cool. Cool. If you if, if you if, if, if oh, no, we've oh, got no, we've feedback. Got feedback. Uh, we right. I'm just gonna mute you for a sec, Chris, because I'm I'm getting feedback from you while I talk, and then I'll I'll unmute you. You can unmute yourself again when I'm done. Um, so I guess um, I guess my question, my my follow up question to that is if if uh, if Foreman's your go to um, for everything, then um, what do you do around monitoring? Uh, my my original question was going to be what's missing. You know, what features or plugins would you like to see? But it, it I guess it naturally leads on to the question of. Um, you know, would would you like to see like some kind of plugin to bring monitoring data into Foreman? Not to replace your monitoring, obviously Nagios and things are better at that. But just to bring a summary into the Foreman view, would would that be the sort of thing that you're interested in? And don't forget to unmute. So uh, monitoring right now for us is kind of in flux. Uh, we're currently using Nagios, but uh, we're exploring some new things. Uh, as far as like a plugin, I would say I wouldn't necessarily. Well, actually, let me res let me change that. I would like to see a plugin uh, for a foreman that kind of ties into a monitoring solution um, that doesn't necessarily show you like everything, right? Like I don't really care um, about coming into foreman and seeing things that are in the green, right? Um, it would be nice if I could come into foreman though, and you know, even if I wasn't looking for something, there'd be like a little dashboard widget. That will show you know things uh, in a in a red state or a warning state, um, something like that. Um, I think going a little bit beyond that, I think it would be really awesome if there was a plugin, uh, much like how the Puppet DB Foreman plugin uh, allows you to view the Puppet DB dashboard. Um, if there was a plugin that could tie into like something like Grafana and let you uh, select or view uh, pre-built dashboards from there. Uh, to view inside Foreman. Um, I think that would be awesome as well. Cool. Um, I guess the two things that, that jump to mind, right, is um, well, the, what I was thinking from the monitoring, there were, there were really a couple of things. Um, in 110, there will be um, multiple status lines for hosts. Uh, if you've not already seen the highlight videos for that, go check it out. Um, but by default, you get you know the puppet status, the build status, other plugins can have more statuses, right? And it's like a lowest common denominator. If one of them fails, that's what gets shown on the host index. So it'd be quite easy, I think, for a plugin to go off and query an API and, and come back and say what that status is, right? So you could go to Nagios or, or Zabbix or whatever and say, what's the status for this host? And if it's anything's failing, that's going to show up as red in your host index, which I think is quite nice. And I think yeah, it's a short, be... yeah, I think it's a short step from there to summarize that on the dashboard of Foreman as well, right? Um, just to show you what like the top 10 alerts are or something like that. The other thing that occurred to me is that uh, Daniel Lobato has been doing some really nice work with the uh, cockpit and replacing the graphs that you normally see on the, the host page, the host show page, with graphs from cockpit. And I think if there's other places we'd like to get graphs from, that could be quite an interesting collaboration as well because um, he's just doing it in a frame, right? So, right. again, yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. Know, uh, the other week, uh, which looked really cool. Um, so I'm kind of uh, interested to see where that goes and how that develops as well. Right, yeah. So I think we're just about wrapping up. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions coming in um, on IRC. Um, I will finish, I think, um, with a last question. Um, you're um, fairly active on IRC and the mailing lists. and. Um, I would be not doing my job as the new community person, right? If I didn't ask if you had uh, any advice for, for either for new users uh, coming into the user community or, or new contributors coming into the dev community. Yeah, so um, pretty much the way I got started uh, in the community and IRC and the Google groups and things like that is, uh, and this might sound like a little jab at the Foreman docs, but I promise you it's not. Um, I mean, I would read through the docs for Foreman and you know, kind of figure out how it works and what I could do. Um, they were, you know, very well written and awesome for uh, 
you know, basically learning how to do the basic things and setting it up and what you can do. And then once you get used to that, you're kind of like, okay, well, you know, where else can this go? What else can I do with this? You know, what are the limitations? What does it not support? Um, and that's really where like IRC started coming in. Um, and especially the Google groups is just asking questions, um, trying to figure out, you know, how you can expand forming into different parts of your infrastructure. What are the cool things you could do with it? Um, and like my experience has been, you know, nothing but good uh, with working within the community. Um, really, the, the main reason why I, I like uh, working with the forming community so much and trying to give back when I can and testing pull requests and trying to backport uh, features from 111 into 19 because I'm too impatient to wait um, is because that whenever I've asked questions or needed help or you know, I'm sure early on I asked a bunch of, you know, very uh, simple questions that I should have known or been able to figure out on my own. Um, everyone is just extremely helpful. Um, there have been times when, um, you know, I've been in private chat and IRC with people troubleshooting, uh, you know, something that only I was seeing in my implementation that, you know, was a weird bug or misconfiguration on my part. And, you know, they had their own job to do at their own company and they didn't have to help me by any means. I mean, they weren't even part of the, the foreman team. Um, but yeah, they took the time out and it was just a really cool experience. Um, I know Witless B worked with me for probably two weeks straight when I was trying to figure out uh, how to get the smart proxy running on Windows for DHCP and figure out a bunch of bugs in there. Um, and that's really what started me with contributing back um, was working with him on the, the window side of things for the smart proxy, um, which was really cool, uh, that he took the time out and showed me the inner workings. And, you know, from there it was just, you know, let me help out other people. Let me give some suggestions, report issues, or, you know, ask for features when I have the time. Um, and it's just a really big give and take. So like, if you're trying to get involved in the community or want to see, you know, what cool things can be done, uh, with the tool set, uh, it's really just go in and ask. And if something piques your interest, there's always someone there to help you out. Thanks very much for the kind words on, on behalf of everyone. Um, I think that wraps us up. Um, do you have any, any last words and maybe, uh, want to cancel the screen share and give a wave? <laughs> um, yeah. So like everyone that you know, joined, thank you for joining. I know, um, you know, I'm not the biggest developer or contributor to Foreman, but because of everyone, we were able to do something pretty cool that fit our infrastructure. And so I'm happy to give back. And, you know, thanks for having us on here and giving us a little shout out for, you know, doing something a little different. Um, I'm discreet in IRC. If anyone wants to chat or ask some more questions, I'm usually in there all day. Um, so, yeah, feel free to, you know, reach out. I'll be around. And, you know, thanks for letting us do this presentation. No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Uh, I hope to, to continue to see you in IRC and, and on the mailing list for, for some considerable time. So uh, thank you again. Thanks to everyone who is watching. This recording will go up on YouTube as soon as I figure out how to move it to the right owner. And um, we'll see you again for another case study in a little while. Bye-bye, everyone.